Hello, everybody. I'm Lisa Sheehan from the Wolf Center at UPMC. I just want to give you a very quick couple of announcements before we jump right into today's event, because we have a lot of useful information to cover today. I will, I will be placing a link to the agenda in the chat section if you, really, if you would like a roadmap of our event this afternoon. Uh, just a heads up, the chat function is inactive between participants. So if you have questions for our speakers, you can submit them at any time through the Q&A function only. Uh, when you submit a question, it'll be viewable by all participants. If you like that question, give it a thumbs up. And that's how we'll prioritize today's Q&A sessions uh, following each speaker. Uh, for CME, uh, following this event, we will send out full instructions to everybody who has registered. And I don't want to take up any more valuable time. So with that, I'm going to introduce to you Dr. Paul Frampas to kick off this afternoon's event. Thank you, Dr. Frampas. Thank you, Lisa. Good afternoon. My name is Paul Frampas. I'm a professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine and Anesthesiology at Pitt and UPMC. I serve as the Medical Director of Patient Safety for the UPMC System and Medical Director of the Wolf Center at UPMC. I extend a warm welcome from Tammy Minier, the Chief Quality Officer of UPMC, who is unable to be here because of an urgent family matter. We are once again excited today as the Wolf Center at UPMC and the University of Pittsburgh Department of Health Policy and Management and Center for Research and Healthcare co-host the annual 2021 Ann C. Sonis Memorial Lecture. The Ann Sonis Lectureship honors Ms. Sonos, who is a loving wife, mother, and grandmother, who had a personal interest and professional commitment to the ideal of ensuring every citizen has the right to compassionate, high quality, and safe health care. The Ansonis Memorial Lecture is one part of the lecture series of Dr. Lauren Roth Quality and Patient Safety Series. In 2008, the UPMC Quality Symposium was renamed to honor Dr. Roth. Dr. Roth has been a faculty member at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and UPMC for more than 40 years. He's been a driving force behind quality improvement efforts at UPMC and spent a lifetime of dedication to ensure patients receive the highest quality care. As COVID-19 unfolded in early 2020, so did the rapid use of telehealth to promote a safer way to care for UPMC patients during the pandemic. Yes, telehealth was used prior to the pandemic, but the prevalence of its use over the last year has increased dramatically as one of the many disruptions forced upon us by the pandemic. Today, we have the privilege of hearing from esteemed experts, national and local, who will be speaking on successes in telemedicine and caring for patients at home. Our first speaker this afternoon is Dr. Joseph Kubidar, Senior Advisor of Virtual Care at Mass General Brigham. He's a professor of dermatology at the Harvard Medical School and currently chair of the board of the American Telemedicine Association. As the author of two books, a blog, and editor of NPJ Digital Medicine, he is working to establish evidence base needed to guide innovation and the implementation of virtual care. Dr. Kuvidar is co-chair of the American Medical Association's Digital Medicine Payment Advisory Group and a member of the Association of American Medical Colleges Technology Committee. Dr. Kuvidar recently testified at a Senate committee hearing on telehealth urging policymakers to take specific actions before the end of the public health emergency associated with the COVID-19 pandemic to make access to telehealth services permanent. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing Dr. Kuvadar speak on moving the hospital to the home, clinical, societal, and technological implications. And with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Joseph Kuvadar. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Now, I just want to make sure I get my slide share correct. Uh, looks like I've got it right. Good. Well, thanks so much. I, I am truly honored to be uh, joining you for this named lecture. I, I can't tell you how much of an honor it is for me to, to be participating this afternoon. And I dare say that although I'm happy to give you my views and thoughts, having almost 30 years in this industry, it is a bit like uh, I think the British say, bringing coals to Newcastle to come to an organization like UPMC to give a talk on telehealth, knowing that your organization has been a leader over the years in this area. And I particularly tip my hat to my friend and colleague, Andrew Watson, who uh, has been a national leader in the area of telehealth and a friend of mine and a, 
uh, we, we kibitz often about the challenges and successes of moving this uh, industry forward. I do wanna start by just mentioning the American Telemedicine Association briefly. Your organization should be a member. Uh, anyone who's interested in this should, uh, I'll have my email up at the end of the slides and please contact me. It is the organization that is acting as the rising tide floats all boats uh, industry voice right now. It's such an important time. I think you all know that there have been a number of regulatory um, issues relaxed during the pandemic that have moved this industry forward very rapidly. And I'll talk more about that uh, momentarily, but it may not be apparent that a lot of those are dependent on changing the law when the public health emergency or before the public health emergency is lifted. So I, uh, and ATA is, is fighting hard every day to make sure that we keep the gains that we've gained during this pandemic. So that's, that's my little uh, infomercial about ATA. And again, if anyone's interested, please uh, do contact me later and we can talk more about uh, uh, your organization being a member. It's well worthwhile. My third introductory slide, and I, I will show this briefly. Sometimes I spend a lot of time on this slide, but I do find that it's grounding. It, it's a, a famous painting by a painter called Fields. It was painted in the late 1800s. It's called The Doctor. One of the reasons I like it is because it really, to me, puts a, literally a spotlight on the doctor-patient relationship. And again, we could spend a lot of time on this. I, I, I will choose not to because I want to get into some more uh, meaty conversation. But the reason I show it today is because of two things. One is it really does remind us what this is all about, which is taking care of patients. And we get pretty involved in high-level technical conversations, reimbursement conversations and the like. It's fundamentally about taking good care of patients. And you'll hear that echoed in my talk over the next uh, 30, 40, 50 minutes uh, as well. So I wanted to make that point. The other is perhaps an irony that this is care in the home. And as the title reflects and, and, our, and our focus today is about bringing care uh, into the home. So we're going backwards in time in some ways in the sense that uh, th this, is, this was common in the late 1800s for the doctor to make a visit. In fact, when I grew up in Barrie, Vermont in the early 60s, I, I was born in 1957, it was common for the pediatrician to come to my house when I was sick and visit me as well. And now we have the technical a capability to do that. Something we call telemedicine sounds very new, but it's fundamentally just bringing the doctor into the patient's home in a way that empowers them and, and increases the quality of their care. So it's, it's uh, the, for those two reasons that I show uh, this wonderful painting to you uh, today. Now, this is the reason that we're really all here. We, we can talk about how the pandemic changed healthcare delivery, and, and I will dwell on that. But I want to remind everyone that this particular phenomenon illustrated on this graph predates the pandemic and will post-date the pandemic, when we get back to some level of normalcy in the next, uh, I don't know, a few months to a year, we'll still have this problem because the demand for healthcare services largely driven by lifestyle related chronic illnesses is simply outstripping the supply of providers. Now, there's one important caveat, and that is that this graph presumes a one-to-one -one service delivery model. That is, you get sick, you see a doctor or a, in some cases a, a mid-level, you get something done. It's tied up two people in time and that's how care gets delivered. What we really need to do is move to one to many. So many other services that you consume have done this already and I like to call our attention to those services, things like Uber, uh, uh, getting the food delivered to your home, Amazon, and th there's a long list where most of your interactions are with software, but these companies have figured out a way to make you feel special, to make you feel like they care about you and to minimize your uh, actual FaceTime or real-time real interactions with a human being. Now that might sound harsh for us as care providers. We, I don't know that we wanna minimize it, but we wanna use it very thoughtfully and telehealth is a big part of that solution. So I just, again, wanted to put that notion on the table that this is about more than 
we had a pandemic, people had to stay in their homes. And so now we can uh, take care of them in their homes and we know how to do that. That's literally just the beginning of where we need to go with this whole thing. So what I'm gonna cover in the next, again, 30 minutes or so is, is here uh, and, and approximately equal um, time for each one. I, I will say that as we go down this list, we get a little bit more um, cutting edge, a little bit more futuristic. And although all these things are in the marketplace now and in play, uh, certainly AI and digital therapeutics are a little more forward thinking. And I did wanna spend some time on them because they will be uh, in your um, consciousness if they're not already within the decade for sure. So we'll talk about all of those. And I wanna start by doing some telehealth terminology. Now, this is not my chart. This is a chart or a taxonomy that was developed by friends and colleagues of mine at the Mass General Hospital Center for Telehealth. Oh, I don't know, maybe a, a dozen years or so ago. But I continue to use it. Our, our terminology can get confusing, not, not only, and I'm not going to really address the hundreds of terms we've used in the last 25 or 30 years, maybe not hundreds, but a dozen or so between eHealth, mHealth, Connected Health, et cetera. I'm going to stay away from that. But just even within telehealth itself, there can be some confusion. So let's just go over this uh, and, and set a couple of things uh, clear. The, the rows are about the interaction, whether it's an interaction between a provider and a patient or a provider and a provider. And of course, if it's between a provider and a patient, that makes it a visit. If it's between two providers, that makes it a consult. Okay, so far, so good, that's simple. The, the columns are about whether it's synchronous or real time, in which case it's a virtual something. And if it's asynchronous or store and forward, as we say in the vernacular of, of telehealth, then it's an E. So the idea that, uh, and I'll talk briefly about this just momentarily, but the idea that a primary care doctor might package some information, I'm a dermatologist by training, send it to me uh, via our electronic record and I could offer uh, her some guidance on how to take care of that patient. That's an e-consult. Whereas uh, if I have a video interaction with my patient, which is the predominant thing that people think of as telehealth in the last year, that's a virtual visit. So you get a flavor for these terminology and I, I wanted to get that uh, up up and running before we get into the heart of the uh, discussion on telehealth because I'll bounce around with some of these terms. And so, as I said, I wanna just briefly address e-consults. It's interesting, but before the pandemic, this was kind of our big claim to fame or certainly something we were very proud of and still are. It's just that over the last year, this whole virtual visit thing has really crowded up everyone's thinking on everything else. And, that is one other con concept that I want to leave you with. Telehealth is very broad. Um, most people uh, over the last year have come to know synonymize telehealth with virtual video. Again, nothing wrong with that as a start, but it really is only a start. And it's quite limiting to think that way. And again, I'll, I'll say more about that as we, as we go through the talk. So at Mass General Brigham, where I work, which is the delivery system in Boston anchored by the Massachusetts General Hospital and the Brigham and Women's Hospital, for several years now, we've had risk contracts with all of our local health plans and the government. And so years before the pandemic started, we, we put this program into place directly as, as in uh, workflow and Epic, so that a primary care doctor can contact a specialist uh, give them some little bit of history, maybe a couple of sentences. Maybe there's a piece of data that they can uh, link to in the chart. Again, in my case, it's usually a series of images of the patient's skin. And then the, the clinician, the, the specialist has, depending on the service, et cetera, but usually about 48 hours to go in the chart and, and, and leave an opinion back. We pay for those internally. There are now reimbursement codes to support them and Perhaps we can talk in the, e, in the Q and A if people are interested in the details around that. But we pay docs internally to do this, uh, not a lot, but enough so that they uh, will prioritize the work. 
And for me, what's the best part of the story is just these stats. So that we've done now almost 80,000, probably by now we have done 80,000 because this is data through 2020. And we've saved about 64,000 in-person visits with specialists. I think that's pretty extraordinary. Now, what's interesting is everyone's waiting room is still full. Uh, as every specialist still has a pretty long wait. So it's, it's not like we cut into their um, uh, business, if you will, but we're enabling them to see the patients that really need to be seen and for primary care to take care of the patients that really need to be taken care of by primary care. So it's a, a, it's a win-win all the way around and it helps us on our risk contracts, which is why we continue to do it. So I, I did, as I say, wanted to put that up front because we're going to get buried in just a minute on virtual visits and we'll have several slides on that. And again, I'll say it one more time, nothing wrong with that. It's important. It's just not the only thing that's telehealth. So now the story of the pandemic uh, in, in the next uh, few minutes. And this is not news, I think, to probably anyone tuning in that one year ago, for us, it was one year ago this week. Uh, approximately, maybe last week, but right around one year ago, we asked our, our consumers, our patients, our citizens to stay at home. And we said, we'll take care of you by telehealth. And we did that literally almost overnight. And I have some graphs, which I chose not to share in this deck because they seem a little bit quaint now, a year later. But there is some very interesting data on the dramatic change in visit volume and how that affected practices and which practices and so forth. And you can see some numbers here. These are, I like this slide because it includes not just health systems, but a couple of vendors as well. Everyone has seen a massive increase. Now, you also know, I think that by uh, the middle of June, we started to drift back a little bit. Uh, my, some people have said to me, well, that, that, is that a failure of telehealth? The answer is no, it was never meant to do everything that way, that, that was something that was an artifact of a lockdown. And now that we have what I call a two channel or a hybrid environment, we're getting some sense of what are the things that are best to triage to telehealth? What are the things that are best to triage to in-person or almost critical? And then there's a, a bucket, if you will, in the middle that could go either way. If in, in your case, if people are traveling from far, far away to see one of your eminent specialists, maybe that's a good excuse to try a telehealth if you can. And what I always ask doctors is, what do you need to touch the patient to make either a diagnostic or a therapeutic decision? And if you don't, I think we can do it by telehealth. We just have to coordinate it. So the beauty of this whole thing is that we brought the doctor's office into your home. Telehealth is now a household word. And any of you who've been in the field uh, can appreciate why I say this because I used to start I, I, at every uh, cocktail party back back if you remember we used to have something called cocktail parties. Uh, I would start by introducing telehealth and then where I work, which we called partners healthcare. No one knew what that was. Twenty minutes into the conversation before I ever got to my point, I don't need to do that for telehealth anymore. It's everyone knows what it is. Patients know what it is. I see see it on billboards. I hear it on the radio. <clears throat> etc. And that's, again, a nice starting point for us. And as I say, we've successfully brought the doctor's office into the home. Now, not everyone has enjoyed that success, even during the lockdown. And the next slide really gives us a sense of this mix. Um, so what this shows is that the decline in visits to a practice during the lockdown phase. And you can see that, for instance, at the bottom of this chart, behavioral health had almost no impact. Well, again, that, that makes sense because all those of you who understand psychiatry know that the physical exam is talking to the patient. And so the fact that we do it by video, we do it in the office. Now, some people even argue that for, for behavioral health, Telehealth is a better tool than office visits because the practitioner gets to see the patient in their surroundings 
the patient is more themselves because they don't have to travel to the appointment. So it's kind of an interesting thought, but behavioral health is for sure a winner. By contrast, at the very top, you see ophthalmology and you can see that's why I chose the picture uh, at the left to illustrate this. I, I, I can't think of something that the ophthalmologist can do without putting your head in about 10 different machines, moving you around five rooms, it's just the way that they analyze the health of your eye. And so that's a good example of one that just simply isn't very telehealth friendly. And you can see other specialists up and down the list as well in between, kind of an interesting uh, graph. Now, there is reimbursement um, for telehealth. Uh, I will talk just a little bit about some of the regulatory uh, um, arrangements around this in a couple of slides. And, I, and I'm not going to read over the codes, goodness gracious, but I, I will point out that this is uh, when now I'm putting on my AMA hat, uh, as was mentioned by Dr. Frampus, I co-chair the AMA's Committee on Digital Reimbursement. And I give the AMA a lot of credit for being ahead of the curve because they started this work in 2017. So by 2020, we were pretty well ramped up with all these various reimbursement codes, which you see listed here for telehealth. Now there's, again, there's, there's uh, always, you know, if, ands, or buts, those of you who know about codes. So some private payers aren't paying for certain codes, et cetera, et cetera, um, but they, they do exist and they can be billed, which is, gives us a foundation on which to measure the work for telehealth visits. And as I said earlier, really now where we find ourselves is a hybrid environment. And that's interesting from a provider perspective. Um, it, it, it really causes people to think a lot about how they're gonna handle this. Now, you know, the first bullet here, I'll give you a quick example of what I mean by that. In Massachusetts, uh, on the, this is what, what I call somewhat of a good news, bad news uh, a joke. It's, it's not a joke, but anyway, uh, my, we, we passed a law, our, our legislature passed a law in uh, late December, and it was signed into law in January. And what that law says is that telehealth will be reimbursed at parity for behavioral health in perpetuity. So good, you know, good checkbox on that one. And for two years, while we gather more data, that seems to be a policymaker's uh, caveat to anything right now while we gather more data. Some of would say that's maybe an excuse to not make a decision, but again, that may be something we can talk about later. In any event, for two years in Massachusetts, chronic illness management and primary care can use telehealth and get reimbursed. What's interesting as a specialist, it puts me in a bit of a dilemma because some of the patients I'll see this afternoon, when I'm done with you, I'm going to do my telehealth session. Some of the patients will indeed be chronic illness. Some of them will not because they're maybe they have a new changing mole or something. And I don't know how we're going to work that. So as you all know, anytime a provider has any kind of uh, uh, brain cramp over reimbursement, they tend to ignore that innovation and go back to the old way they were doing it. So I worry a little bit about that. And of course, as I said uh, earlier, there are some real challenges with Medicare reimbursement that could go away after the PHE is lifted if we don't act and change the law. The practice expense cost is going to be different. That's, I, I've learned that uh, organizations are having a real hard time with this, that those, those operational uh, finance folks uh, in, in your place probably have the same feeling that there's things like facility fees. And if you have a doctor working out of her home and wait a minute, what does that do for our overhead calculation? And what about the staff? Are we paying staff while that person does telehealth, even if she doesn't need the staff, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it really is, I think, something that people are waking up to in this two-channel healthcare delivery world. What I mean by new roles is simply that we have different roles now. When, when you call my practice for an appointment, uh, someone will call you back. Uh, and they will say, would you like telehealth or in-person? And they have no clinical training to know whether your problem is really suited to telehealth or not. It's like, it's a patient choice right now. We have to change that because there are certain things that I will see, hopefully not this afternoon, but have seen some over the last year 
uh, where it really should have been handled in the office. So I think we need to be more proactive about that. Or we need to put someone like a medical assistant on the front end of triage. Imagine that, that we would pay a medical assistant to answer the phone and triage patients. But maybe that's what we have to do. Uh, and so there are all kinds of new rules. There's another rule in my department where patients submit images. Someone has to check, make sure they're in focus, tell the patients if they need to retake them. We use nurses for that right now. I don't know that that's really the labor force that we need to use for that. We probably want to create a, a role for someone trained in, in understanding what images look like. Eventually, software will do it for us, right? So very important. When I said earlier about, I sort of talked about this defining use cases uh, issue, which is just that we need as providers to get out in front of this. And that's very, very important. And finally, a methodology to determine the best use of physical space, because possibly, I don't know about at your place, but around where I work, hospital presidents love to build buildings. And that's a, like a capital campaign. And it's very exciting. I don't know what we're going to do about buildings. We're, we're not occupying them all right now. And of course, the ones we have are kind of crammed. So people are nervous about going to work in them. They, they want to be six feet apart and they're crammed in a cube next to their colleagues. So there's a lot to work through on how we use our physical space in this new two-channel hybrid environment. So I know that's a complicated and dense slide, but I felt like it was important to go through all those are sort of the issues that are on. I'm, best, I'm guessing they're on your minds. They're on uh, certainly on the minds of the executives where I work. All right, well, some of this I've covered, but I do want to go over this regulatory uh, business quickly. So again, it may not be news, I don't know, but a year ago, uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services said that they would uh, not uh, enforce a law called 1834M, which is the originating site rules, which simply means that in the old days, up until a year ago, if you were a Medicare patient, in order to have a provider bill for telehealth, you, the patient, had to be in a health profession shortage area. You had to visit a facility where they had telehealth equipment. And the doctor who was caring for you had to be in a facility. Very 1990s thinking. That's gone now for the duration of the PHE. You can be in your home if you're a patient. I can be in my home and take care of you. Everything's hunky-dory. You don't need to be in a rural environment but it is the law and we have to work to change that law if we're gonna to continue to see the bounty of reimbursement on Medicare. Another issue with Medicare or, or really reimbursement in general is audio only. And I don't think I'll spend too much time today. It may come up in the Q and A, um, but uh, there, there is a, uh, a lot of talk in, the, in these days about uh, disparities. Uh, Intel, excuse me, that was my phone. There's a lot of talk about disparities in the, in the concept of telehealth these days. And certainly audio only is a big way to cross the digital divide. So I do hope that continues to be reimbursed uh, after the PHE is lifted. The, the bullet on technology is simply about uh, uh, not enforcing HIPAA. I think that's more or less become a non-issue now. Most uh, of the software platforms that offer video have developed something that's HIPAA compliant because they saw that this was a business they wanted to stay in after the PHE was lifted. I don't think too many practitioners are using FaceTime or Google Hangouts or Skype anymore to care for their patients. Most have something embedded into their electronic record. And if not, there's a couple of popular ones. Doximity Dialer, for instance, uh, is one that's uh, free and popular. And finally, licensure which I wish would, would uh, solve itself, but it probably won't. Now, 49 out of 50 states have relaxed their laws to allow cross-border telehealth during the PHE, which of course is the right thing to do. Uh, state medical boards tend to be very, very protective of their uh, physicians. So I, I don't think we're going to go to a uh, situation after the PHA is lifted that somehow is wide open borders. But I do hope we'll have something like uh, uh, regional compacts, perhaps, that will help us uh, with this licensure re reciprocity uh, matter. Um, there will be a number of virtual visit add-ons, and I'll go through this fairly quickly, but uh, digital biomarkers are tools on your mobile device that can capture your, usually your voice, uh, and predict things about you. There's, there's a number of them, for instance, that can analyze your cough and, and diagnose respiratory illness. 
there are some uh, that are can uh, based on the sound of your voice can diagnose uh, depression, for instance. There are a number of these. You'll see more and more of those home devices. I'm going to talk a little bit about remote patient monitoring, which I know again has been a big uh, program at UPMC. So I'll I'll address that uh, in a minute. But home devices, if we can get more and more folks with home devices, so that when they need a virtual uh, visit, they they actually can the doctor can get more good information from them. That will uh, spur us ahead. And then home lab testing, which sadly for us, Theranos sort of set us back, but uh, uh, independent of that uh, debacle, there are a number of companies now that can do literally with a drop of blood, run a number of tests, some of them right on a, a chip in the home. So that you'll see that uh, uh, technology proliferate in the next few years as well. And so again, some of this I've covered, but but I think mostly I've covered the provider side of this uh, on a slide, uh, a couple of slides ago on the payer side. And I know your organization is, uh, is an amalgam of both. And I don't presume to understand the payer mindset. So this isn't me telling you what you're thinking, but it's what I perceive. And that is that there's a real worry that telehealth will be uh, additive and not substitutive. Now, I personally think that we as healthcare providers need to come to the table to solve that. That's part of what I said earlier about developing use cases and triage tools so that we're not sloppy with our triage. If we, if we triage the right patients to telehealth, something really magical happens, which is, I, I call it the magic triad of access, convenience, and quality. Um, and it, it really is a special uh, feeling for both the doctor and the patient but we need to do better with those triage tools. And of course, one of the nightmares I know of the, of the payers is that we'll charge an E&M e fee twice. We shouldn't do that. And of course, the other is fraud. And I don't mean to downplay fraud. Of course, I don't mean to. On the other hand, fraud exists in the real world or, or the face-to-face uh, -face world. So holding telehealth to a higher standard on fraud, to me, does not make sense. I'll just say that uh, right now. All right. So as I said, we've, we've successfully brought the doctor's office into the home, but this is really a very limited view of what we can and should do. And I've said that a couple of times. And what I'm going to do now is switch to things that are coming down the pike. So remote monitoring will be the next thing to pop. As I understand it, your organization has done quite a bit of this and a couple of interesting use cases. So my guess is it won't be news to you uh, that it's about to pop. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, digital therapeutics and, and artificial intelligence uh, as well. So it really is our opportunity to reimagine healthcare delivery. Everyone now knows what telehealth is. Everyone has a concept that they can get care from their own home without leaving their home. Uh, people have done a virtual video visit. So not, not only do they uh, FaceTime their, their grandkids, but they now can have video visits with a doctor. It really opens up the creative uh, mindset for both uh, organizers of care, providers of care, uh, and patients. And I hope also for payers. I know, again, payers are fairly afraid of this, but I think we need to somehow come together to get it right uh, over the next few months. Uh, I'm told that the public health emergency is going to be on for the rest of the calendar year, but that only really gives us nine months to sort this out. And if uh, vaccinations and so forth go as planned, you know, fingers crossed by the end of the year, we will probably have reason to lift the PHE. And we really have to figure this stuff out between now and then. So time is short. All right, as I said, RPM is the next to scale. So uh, I, I'm going to just talk a little bit about RPM. Um, I'm assuming that, again, there's some fairly widespread knowledge of this. This is the idea that you have devices in your home, uh, that you're uploading information through the cloud. Usually there's a nurse call center somewhere in the picture that's gathering that information and there's software that's prioritizing the patients who have uh, fallen off parameter, uh, et cetera. And there's a way of caring. Now, one of the reasons I mentioned remote monitoring is it is a one-to-many application. Remember I mentioned earlier, we need to do more one-to-many applications. Just to give you a flavor in our own organization, and I'm going to talk 
for a bit about um, co congestive heart failure because that's sort of the, the um, main use case for this. But in our, or in our own organization, we used to, and still do in some cases, have home care nurses visit these patients in the home. A home care nurse can usually do, I don't know, five visits in a day, maybe six if, if that person's really efficient. A, the same nurse sitting in a call center can oversee 80 to 100 uh, congestive heart failure patients by managing by exception, right? And that's the notion of one to many. So what you see on this slide is simply the data from uh, one study we did on this showing a re readmissions drop. The top uh, uh, green blue line is all cause readmissions. The bottom orange line is heart failure related readmissions and both dropped over a year's time post intervention. So this is pretty solid data, it's been published. We've published a number of papers on this as have others. And so I don't think this is particularly controversial. Uh, you can also do uh, a nice job with, with uh, triaging, uh, or sorry, with, with um, titrating blood pressure medication using this kind of an approach. There are codes to support it now for, for uh, starting patients on high blood pressure meds. Patients that are starting insulin that have type two diabetes, wonderful tool to enable them to um, more efficiently change their insulin dosing because they can get their readings up into the cloud for the, for the provider to see uh, without having to come in for a visit. So those are a couple of three use cases that are useful. And as I said earlier, there are codes. This is just those, that same code set. There's a new code set coming called remote therapeutic monitoring, which will widen the aperture on devices and the types of data that can be submitted for reimbursement. So look forward to that. I think that's gonna probably hit uh, the uh, CPT books and CMS that sort of in 2022. So very quick on remote monitoring. And then uh, to close out, I'm gonna do two more. One is, is digital therapeutics. This really is nascent. The notion here is that um, something, usually a mobile app, could be paired with a device, but often it's just a mobile app, has the therapeutic power to change illness or manage illness that is either as good as or better than a pill or an injection or an infusion. That's the notion of what got this, the term digital therapeutics started. It's a pretty interesting concept. And there are a lot of companies now in this space. And of course, a lot of them are banding together. They have an industry trade organization, the Digital Therapeutics Alliance. They're trying to um, work on some coding. One of the things that my AMA committee is doing now is trying to sort out what this is. It's, it's actually a big challenge because it's not really pharmacy benefit, but it's also not chronic disease management. We're having some challenges with how you should or could reimburse digital therapeutics. So I'll just, just mention and leave it at that. And you see some of the companies that are involved uh, here uh, in that space. Mostly it's behavioral health stuff. Um, PEAR is depression, uh, substance use disorder. Achille is ADHD. It's an interesting company. They have a game that is better for kids with ADHD than Riddle. And of course, maybe that's not a very high bar. Um, Happify is mindfulness and, and, and so forth. So it's, there are a number of interesting companies uh, in this space for sure. And it's something for you all to keep track of. This is just one example from Pair, Reset and Reset O, which are for, as I say, depression and um, substance use disorder. And, and as I said, we're currently looking at how best to reimburse these services. So I save the uh, maybe most frightening, I don't know, uh, for last. I know there are a lot of providers that do find this frightening um, and there's all kinds of concerns about liability and this and that. But I wanna start off the conversation around AI with a story uh, because my, my message is this is a bigger deal than either human beings or technology. The notion that we worry that, that machines are gonna take over our jobs or our thinking I think is Honestly, it's, it's, it's um, a little bit naive, if, if I can say so. And let me just tell you a story that I think illustrates that. So the story I want to tell you is about picking up or recognizing uh, metastatic breast cancer cells in lymph node tissue. And so these days, you'll find that it, it pretty much with a large data set, uh, there are off-the-shelf 
AI algorithms, you can kind of train them to do anything. So someone trained an algorithm to pick up these breast cancer cells and lymph node tissue, and alone, it was 92% effective, which that's a naked number. I don't know if that's good or bad. How does that compare to clinicians? Well, pathologists alone are about 96%. So, well, when they read this paper, they went home happy that day. They weren't as worried about their job security. But the reason I even tell the story is because if you change the system so that the AI is used to sort samples and elevate the ones that it finds confusing to human beings, together, they're 99.5% effective. And this is, I think, a trend that we're going to start to see that it's not an either or, it's allowing computers to do what they do well we as human beings interject bias in everything. Computers simply take the data set. Now you have to train them with a good data set or they too will be biased. That's another story for another day. But they, they will tell you what's in the data and they can do large sums of data almost instantaneously. We have challenges with that. Computers don't do caring. Computers don't do judgment. Computers don't do uh, emotional intelligence, right? So. I think it's really more about a marriage of these technologies than a war between humans and computers. Now in my own field, uh, this has ruffled some feathers, but it's an interesting story. And I tell this story because it illustrates a point that in 2017, this paper came out in Nature um, showing that their algorithm could diagnose melanoma uh, more effectively than a dermatologist. And that sent shockwaves through our specialty but that technology has not been commercialized. And we don't look at images, we look at people. And as I said, we take care of people. We don't just make a diagnosis of melanoma based on a, a view of, a, of an image. So it's an important finding and it's spurned a whole bunch of other interesting research, but it isn't an end all and be all. One area that has gone a little bit further is ophthalmology and retinal imaging for diabetic retinopathy, and I wanted to sort of finish off telling that story. Um, this is an interesting story because it gives us a sense of how this might come out into the marketplace. Now, the company that's doing this is on the market. There is a device. Um, as I said earlier with ophthalmology, you can't, you can't seemingly get, your, uh, get out of the idea of putting your chin in some device, but this is supposed to be in the primary care doctor's office. You put your chin in the device, the device reads your retina. It will tell the primary care doctor, you have retinopathy, you don't. It's worse, it's not. And it's meant to be a triage tool to send you to the ophthalmologist if you need more ophthalmologic care. And it's reimbursed like a laboratory test. There's a code now. Um, and that's what, think of it as like a CLIA lab. I, I like that way of thinking about this. It's a little bit more, um, clean than, than the whole notion of if the, AI, if the AI is doing the work and we're used to reimbursing physician work, how do we do that? We're, that's a real a bit of a brain cramp for us. And some others have come forward again at this AMA committee asking us those questions and we're sorting, trying to sort that out as well, but it's a challenge I have to say. So I'm gonna close out. I hope this was helpful. The solution pieces are all there. The reason I show this slide though, is because they're all different and they don't hang together as a unit yet. And that's what I think you're gonna see over the remainder of this uh, uh, decade that we're in. Uh, by 2030, you'll see some uniform sets of solutions to answer these problems. You'll have, there'll, there'll be a place for, for instance, chatbots, digital therapeutics. It'll all make some sense. Right now it's, it's like, uh, it all looks different and it doesn't hang together in any coherent vision that I've seen anyway. I do wanna remind you all that we have to solve this problem, that this is not a, a sort of a curiosity, that we, we really must solve this problem. And we must do it in a way where we continue to care for people uh, as is illustrated in the painting by Fields. And with that, my contact information, and I'm happy to take questions, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kavidar. Um, I'm going to start the Q&A session off with one of the questions that has had nine people really want to hear the answer to. Uh, with access to technology being limited to some, 
How can that gap be bridged to enable telehealth for the underserved or remote populations? Well, thank you for that. And as I said, that that isn't it's a it's a priority at ATA, and it's on my mind. I wish I had an eloquent, um, brilliant answer for you, uh, but I don't. Um, that doesn't mean we're not thinking about it. We've joined a number of coalitions where we're rolling up our sleeves to tackle this. Um, in some ways, it, 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 Easter's coming, so there's a little bit of Christianity on my mind, but it, it, Jesus said that we will always have poor people with us. In some ways, it has that ring to it. They're, they're, I don't know how you get everyone universal broadband. I, hope, I would love the government to do that in the next... Um, uh, they're talking about another $3 trillion investment, so who knows what that will be, but I'd love it if universal broadband was part of that, that it becomes like the road in front of your house as opposed to something that you have to pay a big stiff feet of Verizon for every month. Um, that would solve some of it. The right, second is device. smart smart devices. Not everyone can afford those. But one, one of the things that we continue to advocate for, as I alluded to uh, in my talk, is audio only telehealth because that really does uh, bridge the digital divide. So we hope that we can continue to have uh, that paid for. Great, audio divide sounds like a, a great possible solution, maybe even in the short term. Uh, so the next uh, second most popular question that we've had submitted today, has there been any research into if telehealth improves outcomes for underserved or stigmatized groups? For example, people who use drugs experience high rates of stigmatization when receiving medical care. Have any protective factors been seen with telehealth in engaging with a population like this? Yeah, thank you for that. So I don't have data at my fingertips, factoids, uh, uh, charts, et cetera. Um, the literature is out there. I just haven't memorized it. And the answer is, is yes. I, I did allude to this a little bit when I talked about the, the fact that behavioral health has been such a success. And it has to do with the fact, as, as I mentioned, that for number one, um, telehealth improves access. Again, with the caveat we mentioned in the last question that you, that you have the tools to get access, but there's nothing more convenient than dialing in from your home or, or having the doctor dial into your home. Uh, you don't have to get in a car, et cetera, et cetera. So, Getting more access for those disorders is important. Secondly, um, getting again, the, the clinician to tune in, if you will, to your home really helps sort out just how acute your situation is, um, how much help you need right now. Uh, it's much, I think, more transparent than having someone travel to your office. So. There's been good good results on that, good data on that. As I say, I don't know the actual stats, but uh, but it's been a, a success for sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question uh, is involving COVID. Uh, I assume there would be a few of these come in. Um, in a COVID recovering patient who goes home with a hospital at home program, which then transitions to home health care and has mul multiple systems involved, should the PCP be the primary navigator? These patients need multiple providers or specialties involved who are going to be ordering tests and medications. So who should be managing the overall patient care in that situation? Great question. Uh, it's a little bit of a feel from telehealth, I think, but, but I'll give you my opinion. I do think the primary care uh, provider is the best person to be, to be overseeing that care. I would have thought it independent of whether technology was involved uh, or in general. So I would, I would advocate for that for sure. Okay, uh, and then why not, uh, as a nurse by trade myself, this question was not submitted by myself, but by uh, Linda Frank, why not use nurses for many of these roles that are needed in triage and actually conducting telehealth? What about interprofessional practice? Uh, patients need a team to take care of them, even in the use of telehealth. Yeah, I completely agree. So as I said, we're we're really stumbling right now, and I think it is stumbling, and, and, and I would say we collectively need to be a little more analytic about it, but we're coming up on these new roles. You know, it, the other way to frame it is a year ago, we, we decided we were gonna scale something overnight that had literally been an experiment for as long as, I mean, for me, almost 30 years and even longer. And when you try to scale something overnight, you just you just learn so many things operationally that you didn't because you can design experiments in a way that you cut out certain populations or things. 
to make it more pure from a data gathering perspective. But when you just open it up, you learn stuff. And so these new roles start coming in. And, and indeed, I think nursing has a huge opportunity there uh, for sure. Um, you know, I like to, one of the principles I like with telehealth is that it is, if, if, if we conduct, if we set it up well, if we organize it well, it's the, the data trove for every patient should be uh, more robust and available to everyone from up and down from the patient all the way up to the most uh, specialized specialist. And when you have that data trove, it should enable care to be delivered with uh, a number. I mean, it could, it could be a medical assistant doing certain things. Nursing could be doing certain things. So completely agree that nursing has a huge role to play. Um, we just want to make sure that we're, we're involving them in roles where their clinical knowledge is, is important. And I think triage may be one of them. Um, we'll have to see how it goes. Uh, kind of in a supplement to that, we had a comment come through, not necessarily a question, um, from one of our people that posted, uh, telehealth has made us think about a public health model for assessment, treatment, and care. So yeah. I think they're in agreement with what you just spoke about. Uh, we do have one more question in the uh, Q&A right now. Can you recommend current resources on the topic of payment for telemedicine services, especially given the temporary PHE standards? Well, again, it's ATA is probably my best resource. Also, the AMA has a lot of content on their website on this. I would say between those two, that you should you should feel well covered. Okay, uh, and this is actually just a quick question that I kind of had myself. I've participated in telehealth, um, but do you see that telehealth has changed the doctor-patient relationship? Has it become more intimate because it's a one-on-one? -on -one? Do you feel it's become more distant? And how do you feel that that might change the care of the patient? Yeah, thank you for that. That's a wonderful question. Part of the reason I show that picture every time is to remind people that the, the, relation, the relationship is, is critical. And I think the answer is it depends. It depends on the patient. It depends on the doctor, right? right. So I'm, I'm the whole time today, I've been intentionally staring directly at this little green dot on the top of my laptop because I know that's where the camera is. Um, you'll see docs that are doing this in their telehealth visits because they're, I don't know, typing or looking at papers on their desk. They don't realize that you're seeing the top of their head. That's one simple example of something we call website manner, right? So if people have a sense of how to interact over technology and you, you accentuate certain things, you only have your voice in your head, you don't have your body language. So there's some training to be done and there's some, um, some insights that people gain by doing this. And I think they can accentuate the relationship. Some patients just wanna come in and if, if, if we can see them safely, they, they should be able to. So it's, it's a complicated answer. As I said, I think on the behavioral health side, it, it absolutely strengthens it because of the uh, mm -hmm. interesting anomaly of how that service uh, is conducted. But other than that, I think it's um, somewhat patient and doctor dependent. Okay. Thank you. In the spirit of your answer, I turned my own video back on. Uh, so uh, one other question did come through. Uh, we're at 154, so we have six minutes left. We, we may have time if there's any other questions out there following Terry's that I'll present now. Uh, maybe one more. Uh, the section 1834M waivers have been critical for reimbursement during the PHE. How confident are you that Congress will enact le legislation, excuse me, to permanently fix this? <laughs> Thank you for the question. I mean, I spend a fair number of my waking hours worrying about that. And, and I'm, I'm quite happy that the folks at the ATA, the policy folks are much, 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 much more sharp than I am on this whole thing on the strategy of how to get it done. I find the way Washington works to be a complete mystery to, to me as a trained physician and a researcher and academician. So, um, so with that caveat, we're optimistic. Uh, there's enough movement of legislation. So one thing you need is legislation has to be moving because this isn't going to come up on its own. It's not going to be its own bill. We, I don't think anyone thinks that. But if it can get tucked into some other legislation, um, we're optimistic. The part that I worried a bit about was the scoring, that CBO has to score it. But according to my colleagues, that's not a big worry. So 
I think it's just finding the right sponsor and the right opportunity to get it amended into legislation. And we're on the Hill trying literally every day to get that done. So uh, I'm optimistic, but but it's not, it's different than sort of taking out an appendix or something where you have a list of things you got to do. This one is, it's there's an opportunistic aspect to it. And so keep your fingers crossed. Will do. Uh, I think that's the last question that we have for you at this time, Dr. Kavidar. But if any okay. participants have uh, lingering questions uh, for Dr. Kavidar, you can still continue to post those in the chat. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to bring back Dr. Paul Frampas to briefly introduce our next two speakers. Thank you, Dr. Frampas. Thank you, Dr. Kavidar. Your talk was both engaging as well as insightful. I think you hit on many important points in a relatively short amount of time technology, billing, revenue, patient choice, and access. They're the things that we always think about when we think of telemedicine. Additionally, some of the glimpses of insight into the future opportunity as well as the challenges were particularly well covered. So once again, on behalf of the University of Pittsburgh and the UPMC Health System, thank you and good luck leading this important charge forward. Our next presentation is by two of our UPMC physician colleagues that I have the good fortune to work with, Dr. Robert Bart and Dr. Rick Wattis. Dr. Bart began working in healthcare IT in 2000 while on the faculty at USC and the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles before moving on to a role as a CMO at the Cerner Corporation in 2007. In 2012, he was the first CMIO for the Los Angeles County Department of Health Services. We were then able to successfully recruit him to UPMC in 2017. Dr. Bart is our Chief Medical Information Officer of UPMC. As the CMIO, he has taken on leadership of all clinical applications. Bless his heart from the clinician side of me. Dr. Richard, better known as Rick Wattis, serves as the Executive Vice Chair, Community Emergency Medicine, and the Senior Medical Director, Center for Community Hospitalist Medicine. Since completing his postgraduate training in emergency medicine at the University of Pittsburgh, Dr. Wattis has been board certified in emergency medicine and recognized as a fellow of the American College of Emergency Physicians. We were also colleagues in residency. He has a great interest in pre-hospital care and currently focuses on all aspects of acute care operations in both the inpatient and the outpatient settings. He has been an integral part of UPMC's COVID-19 pandemic response. I'm pleased to introduce Drs. Bart and Wattis, who will discuss the evolution of telemedicine, turns revolution in the pandemic. In advance, I would like to say thank you both for sharing your expertise with us this afternoon. Dr. Bart, Dr. Wattis, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> Thank you, Paul, for that introduction, um, and doc thank you, Dr. Kavidar, for that wonderful keynote. Um, I'm Rob Bart, uh, CMI at UPMC. Rick Wattis, as you heard, from Community Emergency Medicine and Hospital Medicine. So um, we're going to localize and give you a little bit of the experience that UPMC has had over the last year, predominantly during the pandemic. The history of telemedicine at UPMC goes back to 2006 and started with our total stroke program at that time. Um, it continued to grow, but really um, what made it really popular and, and really revolutionized what we were doing here was unfortunately the pandemic related to COVID-19. During that public health emergency, a couple of things occurred in March of 2020. Medicare made some significant changes um, and there were temporary related to telemedicine reimbursement. And then of course, many of the private payers followed Medicare in that uh, change. Some of these temporary changes, um, probably the most important one was the patient home is now a billable originating site. And that's something that Dr. Kavidar uh, mentioned, as well as I think a question that came from uh, Terry Lewis. So these geographic restrictions were removed. There were also additions to billable services. HIPAA compliance with technology was waived by the Office of Civil Rights. And then of course, uh, telephone only or audio only uh, visits were allowed. <clears throat> For today's presentation, I'm going to focus on two use cases. One is um, the use of telemedicine in ambulatory care, 
and then the second one will be critical care and then Rick will cover um, his particular area related to emergency medicine and urgent care. So as you can tell, this is what our visits for face-to-face -face and telemedicine from January 1st, 2020 through the end of last week were, and the orange is telemedicine. And what you can really tell is prior to the pandemic, very little telemedicine was done. And here, just showing ambulatory telemedicine, you can see we were doing some visits, but a very small number. Um, and then those spiked with that original spike that we experienced here um, in Western Pennsylvania and Central Pennsylvania. And of course, over this most recent holiday season, we saw again an increase in the number of telemedicine visits. This represents about 80% uh, of the ambulatory telemedicine that's done at UPMC. Um, not captured here are those visits done by uh, Children's Hospital and also by our colleagues in Pinnacle or Harrisburg. In preparing for telemedicine, one of the things that we were fortunate to do is we'd actually worked on our patient portal and integration of telemedicine into that. And that really leveraged improving and increasing access from our patient consumers and simplifying the experience for them. This is all work that had been done prior to the pandemic with some initiatives that UPMC had actually been engaging in during calendar 2019. So um, in in good fortune, we were well positioned for what occurred um, about a year ago. Similarly, uh, this goes back to March and April of last year. You can see the growth in the number of provider accounts that we had to create for those who were utilizing our Epic VidYO platform for the, the, the delivery of telemedicine, where we went from about 4,000 user accounts up to over 10,000 in about a four, four and a half week period. And you can also see um, over here in one of the middle columns that the number of actual visits that were occurring um, significantly increased in a very rapid, a short period of time. Um, and a lot of that had to do with the investment in technology that UPMC had, had uh, placed in telemedicine prior to this occurring that allowed us to have, um, I would say, almost seamless growth. We had a couple of growing pains in March of 2020 but they were very limited, um, especially relative to many of our other healthcare systems. <clears throat> I wanna focus um, a little bit just to show you probably, I think one of the most successful divisions in the transition to telemedicine through the beginning of the pandemic to current date. And this is a group of endocrinologists based out at Presbyterian Hospital. And one of the things that's in, that you can see is they transitioned from face-to-face -to, -face to telemedicine in such a seamless manner that unlike some of the other specialties, which had a decrease in the number of visits that was quite significant in March and April of 2020, that they actually had about the same number of visits during those months. And in fact, that transition has continued to occur to today where they predominantly see about 70% of their patients via telemedicine, um, even through, through our current date. Switching gears um, to critical care medicine, um, I'd like to sort of highlight some of the innovation that UPMC is able to bring um, to what we do in, in critical care and telemedicine. So um, prior to the pandemic starting, uh, one of my colleagues, or actually our colleagues, Rachel Sakrowitz and I, we were looking at different tele-ICU solutions, but had not made a decision on one. The pandemic occurred and we didn't have one in hand using the premises of connecting, collaborating, and then documenting a visit, we're able to work with our colleagues over at UPMC Enterprises. And within a short period of time, really from inception conversation to utilizing the solution clinically, it was about 14 days. And so we were able to create something that was quick, connected a bedside clinician, nurse, physician, APP, to a UPMC intensivist, to be able to figure out what was the consultative request that was needed, connect those two clinicians to be able to fulfill that request, including creating a queuing system so that we could triage those critical care consults in a quick manner to make sure all of the needs of the patients and the clinicians caring for them were met. This included using text alerting, mobile platforms, as well as desktop platforms in an integrated tool that we call SAFAR Telecare. Um, predominantly covered this. I think the thing that was most important is um, inception to use was two weeks. 
It was developed all internally. The goal was to develop a workflow tool that would allow a single clinician to manage up to 100 patients and their cons consults at a time. And I think some of you will recall the full page ad that was taken out in the local newspaper here in Pittsburgh as a thank you from New York Presbyterian, where we were able to deploy this technology and assist them in managing their ICU level patients. As a summary slide for some of the telemedicine that we performed during 2020, um, ambulatory visits were over 1.2 million across our system. Ambulatory e-consults were greater than 1,000, and there were 12 of our subspecialty service lines that really focused on leveraging those. Some of the other places that we deployed telemedicine include um, inpatient with our senior living communities, where we did over 20,000 virtual visits. Additional inpatient e-consults for some of the specialty services to, to broaden their coverage to sites they hadn't been covering before. The EICU platform, SAFR, that I mentioned, we did over 1,200 consults, and it's currently deployed across 15 of the UPMC sites. And then we also deployed a significant number of hardware, both um, within our operational facilities, but we had many clinical colleagues who had to deliver care from their homes, so we also deployed to set up um, systems for them to utilize at their home, especially if they would happen to be quarantined at that time. And with that, I will turn it over to Rick. Thanks, Rob. <clears throat> so many of you now have heard the transition from in-person care to the telemedicine platform. And so where did those patients come from? It makes a lot of sense in endocrinology. If you have a practice and you have an established patient base, you would see those patients switch from one to the other. Not so uh, with the emergency department. And when you look at the graph that's up in front of you now, you see in that April uh, timeframe where there was a pretty dramatic drop and then some slow recovery after that, but never really quite recovers back to the baseline that we had seen previous to February or March of 2020. I think this is demonstrated even more dramatically with this graph where you look at uh, the budgeted visits year over year, and you look at 2019 to 2020 um, and what we were expecting and what happened. You can see March and April are absolutely dramatic in terms of the change in in-person visits. People were just afraid. They were afraid to come to the emergency department. They were afraid that that's where all the COVID patients were. And an interesting part of this is we were actually ramping up getting ready to care for an onslaught of patients that in those first few months never really came. However, where they did show up was in telemedicine. Uh, a lot of what Dr. Bart had described, um, we were already managing a telemedicine urgent care platform called UPMC Anywhere Care. And again, the same colors uh, that you could see there is on the previous slide where there's a little bit of activity uh, early on and then the pandemic hits and there's a drop off, but you can see the proportion is much, much different. Toward the end here where you see a lot of this activity come back, this is actually when we started in this light purple is where we actually started doing testing in our urgent cares. Um, and that's what's driving a lot of this. But you could see again, when things heated up and it got busy, telemedicine picked up once again. One of the interesting things we found in the virtual urgent care space was some minor changes, you would say, in the diagnoses. And maybe we're just being picky. But if you look at 2019 and 2020, you can see that the number one was acute upper respiratory infection. We often talk about what do we treat with telemedicine in the virtual urgent care space. And it's, it's almost anything that is, has an itis on the end. So if you have conjunctivitis or you have bronchitis, um, cystitis, those are all things that we typically see. The thing that was very interesting in the switch from 2019 to 2020 in the setting of the pandemic was diagnosis number 11 and 20, where we first saw cough and then fever unspecified. Everybody now recognizes that those were sort of in the early going, the real hallmarks of what we perceived as COVID, forgetting about the exhaustion and the GI symptoms and those sorts of things. Um, so it was very, it was very dramatic when we went back and looked at our data uh, year over year. 
we supported a lot of visits, gigantic increases as Dr. Bart had described, and this took a team. Um, the interesting thing about the team, I think, is this pulled in members from different disciplines that you wouldn't think of normally pairing together. So ISD and marketing and emergency medicine, how do they all fit together with strategic telehealth solutions? And so it was this team that was actually able to pull all this together and make sure that our patients were getting the care that they needed. You saw some of the increases in primary care um, accounts that were established in order to facilitate the telemedicine visits so that patients could see their doctor still. This is actually looking at the number of um, uh, inc accounts that were created for the UPMC Anywhere Care platform so that people could get um, virtual urgent care from their home without having to, without having to leave. One of the other keys to this was, and I think this was brilliant uh, from our system leaders, was that they recognized that eliminating the telehealth co-pays for our patients would really drive patients to the telemedicine platform as well. And all of those things listed on the screen there were all of the different ways that our marketing team came up with to reach out to our patients to say, hey, we're here from you, come in, you can see us via telemedicine, it's safe, it's effective, we can take care of you. Um, and it really was, it really was amazing. And, and, and that's one of the things that has always stood out to me because, you know, in emergency medicine or urgent care even, um, you know, marketing would not be one of the things that we would typically think of. And they really came up with a comprehensive plan. So if you look up in the one corner there, it's really all of the things, the digital things you would think of, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and then across the other side of the screen, the more traditional things like mailers, um, websites, we did some um, even outreach with some phone calls. So there was a whole variety of things of, you know, the way that this was attacked from a marketing perspective, just to get the message out to people that we can still see you, come in and see us. Um, and uh, it certainly helps when someone had the foresight to, to waive the copay part of it, even though they were trivial. Um, we're talking about five or ten dollar copays, but even that just to prompt people to still seek care. One of the things that had been in the background for probably a year before this even occurred was the children's part of this and how do we engage our pediatric partners in order to provide that specialized care to younger children. You know, previously we had stopped caring for children down around age three we said, you know, probably around the time where kids were fully immunized is about where we would cut it off for, uh, for telemedicine by emergency physicians, urgent care, uh, APPs and physicians. But bringing in our children's uh, colleagues, we could really extend um, and not only focus on those older children, but then we extend it all the way down to infants. And so we really could see all mm -hmm. of our patient base um, by including them in this as well. And while the numbers weren't high, um, I think it was extremely successful. And I know that a lot of 2 a.m. visits from parents who were extremely concerned about their young ones with fever, many of which had nothing to do with COVID at the time, um, but still were able to get that reassurance and didn't need to leave home and feel uncomfortable. Um, they could have their child seen. They could, they could be reassured uh, that things were going to be okay. And they were told, if you need to, follow up with us again tomorrow. Just do another visit tomorrow. It's okay. As I mentioned, it took an entire team to do this. And so we had great partners at the UPMC Health Plan that helped with this in terms of phone support. With the explosion of visits being so dramatic, we needed help managing the waiting, the virtual waiting, waiting rooms. We needed help redirecting patients to different providers to try to load balance and get people seen as quickly as possible. And all of those services expanded uh, to 24 hours a day. People called in looking for help. And one of the things that we did with these eight to 10,000 calls per day is we said, it really sounds like you, you want to or you need to see someone. Have you thought about UPMC Anywhere Care? And that really helped to drive uh, the process as well. So this is how our staffing changed. It's, it's sort of interesting when you, when, you, when you look at it. We started out in that uh, early 2020 with five core providers. 
and we had a few other casual people that we could bring in to help out as needed and they provided about 36 hours a day of coverage and they were only seeing about 81 visits at peak we probably had days where we were well over 400 close to 500 visits yep. in a yep. day um, and you can see the number of surge providers numbered 43 at that time and two, who, who were those people well, they're the people who were doing all those in-person visits that we showed you didn't exist anymore on the chart. So all of those, all of those providers had to pivot quickly to getting up to speed on telemedicine, getting comfortable, being able to see those patients, reassure them, assess them, um, and then make some decisions about what care they did or did not need uh, based on those interactions. At this point, and I say post-COVID with a question mark because I'm not quite sure yet. Um, where we are. We're not quite post yet, but we're getting closer. Um, we've maintained that same core provider group. As you saw in some of those graphs, we never really trended back to where we were. The visits have remained pretty high, um, and we are doing a much better job of seeing those patients in real time. And a lot of this still happens out of our urgent care, where we have had some patients coming back, not to the levels that they were, similar to the emergency department. Um, but a lot of those people are doing both duties while they're in the urgent care. If they're not seeing patients in person, they're doing telemedicine visits. One of the interesting things that came out of this, and, and again, if you want to see the silver lining on the pandemic, at least from our standpoint in urgent care, is we were actually seeing our wait times start to increase. So you can see in the yellow and green, those yellow times are higher, 2020 over 2019. And then you see the giant spike in March, which was almost all the beginning of March. All of those teams came together. Everyone was in collaboration uh, with one another. And you can see what happens the next month in April. It wasn't because the volume went away. The volume was still thriving in April, but our times in April were actually better than they had been previously because everyone got on the same page. Everyone was very focused and that performance continued. The reason I have the purple, the light purple and the dark purple graph is just to say, all of that good stuff happened, despite the fact that visits were actually taking us longer to complete. And this was all because of COVID. Um, people had a lot of questions. They wanted to understand. Um, back then, we didn't have a ton of answers, but we tried to explain the best we could. And so providers did end up spending more time, but because we were able to surge with the people we had and they could take on this new task, we were still able to get to people much more quickly, get their questions answered. And, and provide great service. The great service is seen from both the provider as well as the patient. So if you look at these patient ratings and provider ratings, you know, the dark purple, I don't know any service line that would be disappointed with a 4.9, I'll take it. Um, and the providers really embraced it. These were, a lot of these people were not people who had done video visits before. This was brand new to them. Um, but they had a great experience. They enjoyed interacting patients in this way. They felt good about the work that they were doing um, and they felt safe um, at a time where we didn't really understand what safe was. Again, a little bit of the ratings. If you look at the first half of 2019 to 2020, we really didn't lose anything. Despite a month of increasing wait times, people were still understood. We were in the midst of ramping up um, and then ultimately um, ultimately, we're able to deliver that performance based on all of that collaboration uh, that I spoke about. The patient reviews here, I think, are telling. And so a couple of these, I'll just grab a couple of the quick lines. Greatest app to be ever created, um, I think, is, is, is interesting. Uh, very satisfied. It's just so easy to be at home and have a doctor visit. Thank you. I'm a diabetic and I'm a previous healthcare provider. I would have typically gone to the ER. My provider today eliminated cost, hassle, and time. I received excellent treatment. Um, first time using this app and I'll use it again. Best thing in the medical area. This app may have saved my life by allowing a doctor to video chat with me and assess my situation so I didn't have to go to the ER. And here it is, be around all those people that had COVID. Um, and fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, in those very early months, our emergency departments were not very full at all. 
um, we would have happily had people to come in. And the, the interesting thing about this last one down here is this was a person who didn't have UPMC health plan. And so they spent $60, but they say it's well worth it and I highly recommend it. That was our experience, both with primary care, intensive care, emergency department and urgent care. Um, and so we would be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Drs. Bart and Dr. Wattis. A lot of important information there. Um, I have a couple questions in the chat waiting for you. Uh, one is kind of loaded, and I'm not sure if Dr. Kavitar may also want to weigh in on this. Uh, last week, Amazon announced they are launching Amazon Care in all 50 states with a focus on virtual primary care and chronic condition management. How can traditional healthcare systems continue to add value for patients when so many non-traditional and digital health entrants are offering new services and platforms? Well, I'm, I'm happy to go first. I'll say we, we, we need, we, healthcare delivery needs a kick in the pants anyway, uh, honestly, I think. <laughs> and so good, good for them. I, I do, I, I guess I believe that Traditional primary care is a pretty satisfying experience for most patients. And so, again, I think having a little bit of competition will be good for us. It'll be good for the marketplace. I think we'll, we'll still have plenty of patients that want to come to see traditional care providers. That's my feeling. But I'm, I'm happy to add a thought to that, sure. Lisa, beyond what Dr. Kavitar said. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, one of the comments he made early on in his presentation that, that telemedicine during the pandemic was sort of a necessity of the care delivery process. And one of the things that um, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about is how, how do we change that paradigm so that telemedicine becomes baked into how we manage a disease process? And I think that's one of the pieces that an Amazon or others that are gonna exist in a 100% virtual care world are not gonna be able to um, really compete with. Um, for example, prenatal women's health, ACOG has 14 standard visits. Um, we've been working with our women's health professionals around which of those visits would be appropriate and can be done in a manner that not all 14 need to be face-to-face, -face, right? And so can we intersperse an appropriate five visits for telemedicine amongst those 14 in someone who's otherwise having a, a normal healthy pregnancy or in the ma management of congestive heart failure. If you need, if you're someone who typically is seeing your cardiologist every three months in the management of your disease, it, it may be necessary for you to do that, but maybe those visits can alternate between face-to-face -face and virtual care in between, or could you even change the paradigm further and say, Maybe we should do a short virtual check-in visit with one of my APPs or assistants on a monthly basis, but I will see you every six months and they'll keep me informed. And maybe we can then actually use this as an opportunity to improve the quality of your care and the quality of health and life that you have. So I think that the, there will be those who have what, what UPMC will consider predatory behavior on our market but I think the advantage that UPMC has is we actually have the opportunity to actually take virtual care and bake it into the traditional care delivery models that we've always excelled at in the face-to-face -face world. So I can I could even add to that just as an example from what we, the feedback we get even in the virtual urgent care space. So first, Amazon obviously is a fabulous operation, right? Who hasn't bought something from Amazon, right? They're amazing operational experts. Um, and I agree with you, we need a kick in the pants. We do, um, I agree 100%. Some of the feedback that we have gotten from our patients though, who have come in through the virtual urgent care platform is, wait, you know me? You have my records? You know what I got discharged from the hospital with the last time mm -hmm. I was there? You know what my medicines are? People are amazed that we would have all that information at our fingertips. And so when our virtual urgent care providers are online and they're seeing a patient, they can say, oh, I see your cardiologist is Dr. X. I see your PCP is Dr. Y. And I see that you were on this medicine. Are you still taking that? Great, I'm glad we had a good visit today. I'm gonna send your doctors a note right through the electronic health record so that they know what was going on. People are amazed. That's the advantage I think we have. Absolutely. We, we, know, our, we know our consumers, we know our customers very well. 
just that sense of feeling connected to the provider that you're speaking to, I think is important as well. Um, so this is a quick question, I believe, for uh, Drs. Wattis and Bart. What is the name of the patient review app that you referred to in the uh, end of your presentation? I'm not sure. Um, I'm thinking it came in around the time of, yes, when you were presenting some of the patient reviews. Was that through UPMC Anywhere Care? Uh, yeah, this is gathered up by our okay. marketing team. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Well, one, one of the things I can add, Lisa, is um, so many organizations, including UPMC, use press gaining for patient mm -hmm. collecting patient feedback. Actually, prior to April 1st of 2020, press gaining didn't collect feedback on telemedicine visits. Um, and they did implement that when the, as the pandemic started. And we utilize that across UPMC to make sure we're getting good patient feedback on um, our visits. Yes, as a Wolf employee, I hear those words often. Uh, so sure this will be our final question before we give the uh, microphone and camera over to Dr. Mark Roberts. Uh, please share solutions to some of the challenges you faced assimilating new providers, particularly those who were reticent and or resistant prior to the pandemic forcing their hand. Yeah, I think from, from our standpoint, we did have those providers. They were very I'll say risk averse. They thought that telemedicine was full of risk. I can't, mm -hmm. I can't really see the patient. I can't touch them, et cetera. And I think what we were able to do by pairing people closer than we are now, but doing visits together with patients um, such that you could say, you know, well, let me see your throat. Hold the camera a little closer to your eyes. Um, can you do this for me? Can you do, you know, a somewhat of a neurologic exam? Um, and when you really work through some of those things with providers who are hesitant, um, out of fear, uh, it brings them around mm -hmm. and they really seem to engage and, and start to realize like, Hey, I can do this. I can really gain a lot of information without actually touching the patient. Yeah. I, I, I'd echo what Rick said. We, we tried to leverage those individuals who are in their field of expertise or specialty that were comfortable with it to sort of teach their colleagues to make them more comfortable with it. You know, cardiologists and, and pitting edema, it's pretty easy to take have of the patient say, hey, right. can you take your smartphone, show me your ankles, can you press on them? Mm -hmm. But it, it's, it's thinking about it differently than you doing the examination yourself. And so um, we have a lot of really well-engaged clinicians here who I think really helps facilitate the efforts that we were trying to do across UPMC. And I think having the endocrinology example, too, is always a good good thing when you have somebody trying to lead and be proactive instead of reactive and inventive at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you for all of your insight to all of our presenters today. I'm just going to hand this over to uh, finish out the day with a bang to Dr. Mark Roberts of the University of Pittsburgh. Take it away, Dr. Roberts. All right. Thank you. I just wanted to say as one of those interns who was one of, and I've been doing virtual visits now for all year, and I was drag kicking and screaming into the virtual visits, but it worked just fine. So I have to admit that um, although I was skeptical, it's been working quite well, I think. So I just wanted to thank everybody for um, joining this year's SONUS lecture. And uh, I would like to thank UPMC for letting us the last couple of years merge this with the educational activities of the Wolf Center. I would really like to thank Dr. Kvidar, uh, Wadis, and Bart for their input. And to say that I, I think this particular situation of moving more towards virtual visits and the ability to connect with a doctor at um, seemingly random times would actually rest really, really well with the Stonus family and the Stonus idea that we were trying to make healthcare safer and of higher quality. I, I think, I mean, I know it hasn't been proven yet, but from what you guys have said, I would suspect that we can do a lot to improve safety and effectiveness of healthcare using some of these telemedicine characteristics. So I wanted to, I, I would like to thank all of our speakers. I'd like to thank the Wolf Center and I'd like to thank Sue Borowski who um, did all the work, did a lot of the work behind this to, to make all this work. And um, we will uh, hope to continue the uh, efforts of improving uh, patient safety and, and quality of care at, at UPC and um, we will see you next year.
Thank you, everybody. And as a reminder, I will send out CME instructions for uh, 1.5 continuing education credits following the event.